Welcome back to 23 Degrees Sideways. We're going to talk a little bit more about perhaps the most fundamental freedom. And now to talk about the right to travel as perhaps the most fundamental freedom, we have to get away from the scarcity model of agricultural societies. So I'm going to get a little weird and a little freaky here as I talk about this. So, um, you know, we talk about pre-industrial societies and how things were rougher and tougher and more scarcity, more difficult, how, um, you know, it goes all over. Like, for example, the role of women in early agricultural and especially tyrannical agricultural societies um, is horrible, all right? Women... If you want women's liberation, you need to have the ability, the functional ability, to have women's liberation. Now, what that means is that you have to have the carrying capacity. You need to have workloads that are appropriate. You need to have um, a, a certain lack of scarcity. It's it's kind of interesting because in a lot of a lot of agricultural societies, women don't have the same economic value as men and that's actually a really big deal because agricultural societies are revolve around producing lots of labor lots of human labor to produce food for the ruling population that's just basically how it goes hierarchy is part of agriculture and i'm not going to go too far down this road because what i've what I really want to point out is that there's a pre-scarcity model if you go pre-agriculture. Agriculture really invented the notion of hardcore scarcity, all right? There was never a carrying capacity problem prior to agriculture for various reasons, which we'll get into in just a moment. This is a philosophical video, and I'm going to discuss some philosophical aspects, but I'm going to discuss them in a primary sense first person. When I discuss philosophy, I tend to think of it as myself thinking of philosophy. My goal with philosophy is not to study academically other philosophers and then argue about them. Okay, the idea, a primary philosopher, the people you argue about, if you're an academic philosopher, are the people who did the thinking. Okay, philosophy is about doing the thinking, not arguing about other people doing the thinking. So, we're going to discuss a little bit of philosophy here. I'm going to say things that sound very similar to other philosophers that you've read or heard or heard people talk about on Twitter, all right? That's inevitable. Humans do tend to have certain thought processes in common when they come to certain conclusions, but I'm not plagiarizing. I'm not stealing, I'm not, whatever it is that you're going to try to accuse me of to make this all negative and denigrate the video. This is all just basically primary thought. I want you to listen and consider some, some aspects here. Prior to the agricultural devolution, revolution, whatever you want to call it, we had, we existed within the carrying capacity of the hunter society hunter-gatherer, but hunter societies, okay? And even with the early stages of agriculture, before it got into mass agriculture, where it was more pastoral, what we would call pastoral now, you didn't, you didn't, you never had the carrying capacity issue. You didn't have the land issues, the border issues, the overpopulation issues, or the restriction issues. So th this is very important to remember because that is where fundamental scarcity comes from. A person of reasonable intelligence with reasonable physical skills should be able in a temperate climate, um, prior Paleolithic, Neolithic, um, prior to the advent to the expansion of settled, real big large-scale settled city agriculture, should be able to just by virtue of making it to adulthood, handle gathering food, hunting or gathering, mostly hunting, 
you know, we can debate that, but it is, it, it is in the end mostly hunting, gathering food, um, and basic staying alive in temperate climate without a whole lot of stress, without a whole lot of, um, chronic stress, okay? There is, of course, stressors, like hunt, be hunted, that kind of thing. But the chronic stress, the scarcity stress, the thing that actually gives people heart attacks and diabetes, okay, that isn't there. That that scarcity isn't there. Okay, nothing's been overfished. Everything's in its in in its season is available. There's there's nothing there's nothing wrong. Okay, it's not Eden. All right, the risks are real. Okay, you're you're going back to an era when tigers were in the Caucasian the Caucasus, um, Caucasian areas, and, you know, Iberia had predators that would eat man, stuff like that. This, this is, um, not a low-risk Eden kind of environment, but in a very fundamental way, you did not lose any significant level of security by leaving, okay? This is an important point. The, the right to travel is a pre-agricultural fundamental human right. It's, I would say, deeper than the right to self-defense is the right to leave. And what I'm getting at with the lack of scarcity in the carrying capacities, we weren't overpopulated in any given zone. We are, we are social species, and our tendency is actually to be friendly to each other on an individual basis, not to be really ridiculously asshole-ish to each other. Okay, the curse of... It's politically incorrect, but the curse of Africa. And if, just, if you're a Middle Eastern or an African vet, Mediterranean veteran, you just, you'll know what I mean. If you're not, you're just not going to understand. There, there's a curse of some areas... Um, some sort of cultural meme of inhumanity that's just isn't there in um, a lot of pre-agricultural Neolithic, Paleolithic societies. And that's important, okay? Just the mass of man as a whole. Fundamental right to travel, the right to leave. We tend to be friendly, so you don't leave and then go off into the wilderness and be by yourself forever. But that ability to leave also means that groupings are a little bit more free associative and a little less um, hierarchically mandated, mandatory, forced, enforced than, than they are as agricultural gets rolling, okay? So with your early hunter, hunter-gatherer, and pastoral groupings, you have a much more impressive ability to leave. That freedom to travel is a fundamental, very, very fundamental, very core human freedom. It's, it's a pretty close to an essential part of what makes humans human, okay? It's really that deep. Um, I would say it's probably even more core than the, the right to self-defense or the, you know, the right to freedom of expression or anything like that. It's the ability to go, to go, to do your own thing, to, to not be um, beholden to or enslaved by another person. It's very fundamental. Now, we've gone, we've had ups and downs with this. When we talk about Rome, when I talk about Rome, I'm talking about a society that spent centuries increasing that freedom, that indiv individual freedom to travel. Yes, they had slaves. Yes, that doesn't apply to them. I understand all of that. <clears throat> but the, the overall freedom to travel, as opposed to just being a landed serf, part of the land, increased dramatically through the Roman civilization, Roman era, the Roman Empire, the Republican Empire. And that was a big deal. And they got to a point where almost half of everybody took off. That, that, that's a huge, huge, amazing thing. 
And then, of course, it goes down. And by the time you get to some parts of the Middle Ages, um, you li literally, the surf is part of the soil, part of the land, belongs to the land, and you, you end up with these landed mythologies where you can't leave. You can't go. You belong here. And you get, you get the modern racial... Um, racialists of they're not necessarily racist but you get modern racial groupings who talk about that the land is the blood and everything and they belong here and they belong with this tree and they belong with that and you get this with native americans and you get this with norse people and you get this with african originalists and you get this with all sorts of people okay i'm not allowed to like turquoise because my hair is blonde whatever stupid shit like that but that actually mostly comes out of that post-axial agricultural um, development, that, that, that lack of the ability to travel. And it goes down, and it goes up. Rome, we see a high point. It goes back down. Then with the Enlightenment, and several things happen with the Enlightenment. One is that agricultural technology actually gets good enough that you have a little less of the scarcity going on. Another is that, well, travel gets going, you know, travel and trade, and that expands people's horizons dramatically. And then, you know, it goes through and you get the, you start to get liberal philosophies, classical liberal philosophies about humans being free. And then the, the right to travel gets tacked on to that. Instead of being the basis of that, it gets tacked on to that. And then you get to the Americas, all right? And once we get going, it's, it's a pretty big deal. Some, some of us went across the country, ancestors, not me specifically, I'm not that old, with hand carts. Like, there's people who do that now, you know, they'll use a, a bicycle stroller kind of thing, and they'll, they'll rig it up with a backpack. Hand carts, you can move with a hand cart. But then it gets really, really going when we come up with this whole automobile business, all right? Holy shit. Katie, bar the door, man. Because now travel is the big deal. Because now travel includes everything you need, okay? Modern Americans are ridiculous in, in hoarding stuff. Just sheer shit, okay? Um, in the 20s. In the, in the 19 teens, in the 20s, in the 30s, families could move. Family, two, three kids, all of their belongings that they needed could move with a Model T. They could even live out of a Model T. Model Ts are not big, you know. Model A is even better, right? But a Model T is not big, but people could do that. It's a lot different than relying on your foot, backpack, or a horse. Okay, it's just, it's a significant difference. And things get really big. And it's one of the biggest, biggest advances in, in of humanity post-enlightenment is this whole automobile thing, right? We massively increase the ability to travel. The ability to express the right to travel. Now, people still do it by foot. You know, I, st I have a dream. Kids are a little too young right now. Although, attempting to just take them to do one of the long hikes, okay? You know, Arizona to uh, northern Idaho or the Appalachian Trail or some, some one, of, one of the more fun, and I don't want to do the Pacific Crest Trail. My, my goal isn't to be above 4,000 feet. It's just to take a long walk, right? Do a wander. Um, we, we still do that, you know? People can do that. You can do it on bicycle. I live near US Highway 50, and every summer, it's just a constant stream, right? There's a couple of couple groups or individuals every day riding through, right? Doing a cross country ride. That's a lot of people if you if you add that up, you know, two hundred days, you know, five, six, eight, twenty people. That's a lot of people. Um but the automobile really changes the picture of that. Okay, it changes the picture for the people who are walking and people who are bike riding also because we get this road network, and this road network is incredible. And it's really important economically, socially, socioeconomically. It's just, it's super important culturally. And one of the biggest arguments I have with 
traditional capital L libertarians is about that because I don't think they ever understand the road system very well or the effects and necessities of the road system. So, whatever. They, they, the fundamental right to travel presupposes that you have a way to travel, a place to travel to, and in the libertarian worldview, every square inch of the earth is privately owned and you don't have a right to go anywhere. So there's kind of a fundamental breakage there. I cannot philosophically accept that the right to travel is not the fundamental core set of human rights. It's in it's in there. It's not the basis, but it's one of those those group of five or seven or nine core fundamental things that make human freedom human freedom. Okay. So the right to travel gets this huge massive um, boost almost back to pre-agricultural levels with the automobile and now the modern idea here is that we're going to regulate automobile travel to the point where it's too difficult and you can't go anymore you can't afford it you can't regulate you can't do the paperwork you don't have the license you don't have this now they're talking about vaccine passports all sorts of restrictions to get rid of the automobile now they want to replace it with the magical train Okay, the mass transit, which is going to restrict your movement very dramatically because that's a corridor based travel system, all right? It's not a star pattern system, it's a ring pattern system. And um, topo this is topology. Okay, so a ring system is you do rings, the rings interconnect and everything, and you, have, you, you, you do have branches, but it's very much lines, lines, lines circles okay and with a star system you go into almost a fractal mode where you get ever decreasing size but more spread and density it's one of those things that you actually if you look at the maps of how roads work in the u.s and you get down to the dirt road level they're everywhere okay you can go anywhere and Sometimes it's actually a little annoying because every once in a while you want to go find a mountainside that doesn't have a jeep trail on it. But, you know, we have roads to go everywhere. You can't do that with rail. Rail is much more of a ring system, okay? It may look like when you have spurs, it may look a little star-like, but it's not fundamentally a star topology. It's a ring topology. And that restricts your freedom. It decreases your horizons. It decreases your growth and it makes for a much easier to enslave, less free population with fewer opportunities and less prosperity. That's important because everything that Pete Buttigieg is advocating right now has that direct effect of decreasing prosperity, decreasing freedom, decreasing opportunity, and decreasing actual fundamental progress, okay? Very against this guy's policies, uh, or proposals. And I'm very against the idea, these, the, the people who want to replace freedom of travel with these mandated systems, mostly because then you don't have to have you don't have to worry about smog checks and licenses and things. And of course, you shouldn't have to worry about that, okay? That's not, that's not a fundamental part of the right to travel. And we'll talk about that again soon. Stay sideways.